I will introduce uh, Jeffrey in a, at greater length in a moment. But Professor Sachs, thank you so much. It's really an honor and a privilege to have you with us um, uh, today. I also want to recognize, and again, I will do uh, uh, some longer introductions uh, at the appropriate time of our panelists uh, for this um, uh, uh, for today's uh, panel discussions. We have Jared Bernstein, who is senior fellow at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. Uh, Janet Mills, who is Maine's Attorney General. We thank you for rearranging your schedule, for being here and, and joining us this morning. Um, Thea Lee, uh, who is Deputy Chief of Staff with AFL-CIO. KJ Hertz, where are you KJ, back there? A Senior Legislative Representative at AARP. And Debbie Barker, uh, International Program uh, Director, Center for Food Safety. Uh, and to all in the audience, I thank you uh, for being here, but to our panelists, thank you for sharing your insights, your experience uh, with this issue, uh, because I think it is so important uh, to the discussion. Uh, uh, right now, uh, even as we are gathered, the U.S. Office of the Trade Representative uh, is working uh, overtime uh, to finalize a new NAFTA-style trade pact, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, it's a 12-nation trade deal. As you know, it would force Americans to compete against workers from nations such as Vietnam, where the minimum wage is $2.75 a day. Uh, it also threatens to roll back financial regulation, environmental standards, and American laws that protect the safety of the drugs we take, the food that we eat, and the toys that we give to our children. It would create binding policies countless areas so that Congress and state legislatures would be thwarted from uh, mitigating the PAC's potential damage in the future. Uh, naturally, the many ramifications of this deal are causes for concern to me, causes of concern to so many of my colleagues, uh, and to the American people at large. According to the polls, nearly two-thirds of Americans oppose the granting of fast-track authority to the President to negotiate this PAC. Last year, 178 House members from both parties, they say we can't get along, but we're getting along on this issue. 178 House members publicly declared their opposition to it, and still the administration uh, has been moving forward. Today uh, is intended as an opportunity for us, before the ink is dry on this newest arrangement, to look back at the impact of previous trade pacts like the TPP, free trade deals like NAFTA, the Korea Free Trade Agreement was signed in 2011. For example, 20 years ago we were promised that NAFTA would bring an unprecedented economic boom, 200,000 jobs in the first year alone. Two decades later, we know for a fact it's not how it's played out. In 1993, before NAFTA, America had a $2.5 billion trade surplus with Mexico, and a $29 billion deficit with Canada. By 2012, that has exploded into a combined NAFTA trade deficit of $181 billion. Since NAFTA, more than 845,000 U.S. workers in the manufacturing sector have lost their jobs due to imports from Canada and Mexico or the relocation of factories to those countries. Not exactly what was promised. Uh, along with analyzing economic and trade impact of these previous deals, our panelists today will also evaluate what we can expect from this particular agreement if it becomes law, how it would affect issues ranging from Buy American to currency manipulation to food safety. Congress has always had an important and a constitutional role to play in trade matters, but this deal has been mostly negotiated behind closed doors. And today, it is about looking to get to the bottom of what the TPP means for America and American workers and families. Um, because we need to make sure that the trade deals that we agree to join are mutually beneficial and grow our exports while doing right by our workers and right by our priorities <coughs> as a nation. With that in mind, I want to introduce to you this morning's keynote speaker, Dr. Jeffrey Sachs, <coughs> Professor of Economics at Columbia, an advisor to the UN, a best-selling author, an outspoken leader on behalf of sustainable development. 
For over two decades, Dr. Sachs has worked to promote policies to help all parts of the world benefit from economic opportunities and well-being. As director of the Earth Institute, he has been at the forefront of some of the leading debates of our time on issues like confronting global poverty, global, uh, uh, global poverty, globalization, economic development, and climate change. He's an economic advisor to governments in Latin America, Eastern Europe, the former Soviet Union, Asia, and Africa. He helped the United Nations craft the Millennium Development Goals, the internationally agreed goals to reduce extreme poverty, disease, and hunger by the year 2015. He's also advised the IMF, the World Bank, OECD, the World Health Organization, and the UN Development Program, uh, among other international agencies. He has been named one of the 100 most influential people in the world by Time Magazine, and the New York Times Magazine in 1950 called him probably the most important economist in the world. Best-selling books, End of Poverty, Commonwealth Economics for a Crowded Planet, and The Price of Civilization. It's an honor to have you with us this morning, Dr. Sachs, and we look forward to, uh, to hearing from you. And when Dr. Sachs concludes his presentation, we will open up uh, for, for Q&A. Thank you. Congresswoman, thank you so much. And thank you for holding this forum, which is extremely timely and indeed very important. The United States is engaged, of course, in two major negotiations on uh, trade and investment, uh, both the TPP and the TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. These are extraordinarily important. I wish we knew more about them. They're also secret. Uh, there are leaks. Uh, there are uh, snippets. There are people here who are uh, engaged uh, in some of the negotiations, but the public is not engaged. So a lot of what we say is uh, a bit speculative. The fact that the public is not engaged uh, means that we should worry, because we do know that when things are managed in secret, as these negotiations have been, it's the organized and powerful interests that by far dominate the proceedings. These are largely industry and lobby-driven activities. They are not uh, yet in any way proved to be in the interest of the American people. And this is a matter of significant concern. This is called an international trade forum, but we should be clear that it's an international trade and investment forum, because perhaps at least as much as trade, it is the opening of the world in the last 30 years to financial flows and foreign direct investment that have reshaped the world economy. And this, these two treaties are primarily investment treaties, uh, even more than trade treaties. Though trade is an issue, the regulations and procedures and standards governing international investment are also very much at stake and in many ways extremely worrisome. Let me start with a very general economic proposition, uh, and that is that international trade and investment can be a force for mutual good of all parties, in fact. But a second proposition that's sometimes forgotten in the rah-rah of free trade rhetoric is that simply uh, open trade or open investment by itself has no guarantee of meeting the criterion of raising well-being broadly, much less across the board. The first thing that one learns in the first uh, week of trade class is that trade has effects both on the uh, size of economies but also on the income distribution. There can be winners as well as losers. And in general, in trade uh, class, you learn by the second week that in order to have a widespread improvement from trade, there has to be some kind of redistribution that goes along with the trade policy to compensate losers in the process of also enjoying the benefits. 
We live in a society, however, that not only does not have such redistribution, the redistribution goes in the opposite direction in the last 30 years. The redistribution is mostly from the poor and the middle class to the rich rather than the other way around. And there's nothing in these trade agreements, trade and investment agreements that are being negotiated that even address the issues of distribution. The second thing that one learns in trade theory is that in a world of uh, many uh, so-called market failures, externalities, spillovers across borders, uh, and these come in many shapes and forms. They come in financial crises, they come in the form of environmental crises, they can come in the form of health crises. Trade by itself does not necessarily improve the situation if these spillovers or external effects are also not being addressed. And therefore, when President Obama talks about TPP and TTIP being 21st century trade agreements, the starting point should be that the phenomena of globalization more generally, the extent of financial crises, the uh, growing environmental catastrophe worldwide of climate change and loss of biodiversity, the crises of international disease such as we now have with Ebola in West Africa need to be not only considered as footnotes, and they're not even that in any way, but they need to be in the forefront of our international economic relations. In other words, trade and investment treaties need to work for solutions in those areas, and certainly not to exacerbate these crises. I would say from all that we know, and unfortunately I can't tell you that I know the latest script of either of these treaties, I do not. I have not read a copy of the 39, or 29 uh, uh, chapters uh, of uh, TPP. Uh, I do not know what's on the negotiating table, but from what I do know, we have a lot of reason to worry that all of the considerations that make international trade and investment potentially beneficial are not being joined by the kinds of policy measures that are needed to ensure that they are in fact beneficial. So I don't want to come here in the guise of anti-trade or anti-investment. I want to speak uh, in a position of what I think is responsibility to core goals, to core standards of fairness, to environmental sustainability, to narrowing income inequalities that have reached historic highs in our country and that will be exacerbated by many of the things that are proposed by at least some of the actors right now. And in that sense, I can't support either of these negotiations with what I see now. I think that they would distract us from the more important global issues. I don't think they rise close to the standard of being 21st century trade and investment agreements, not even close. They are very much 20th century agreements which were already out of date by the time they were negotiated. This is a NAFTA treaty writ large, or this is the same kind of negotiation that we've had in many other cases. Our country has not taken up the leadership on income distribution, inequality, <coughs> environmental degradation at a global scale, the global health crises adequately, and so on. So let me make a few uh, observations and then recommendations. First, let's keep in mind in our own uh, rhetoric that uh, these proposed agreements are mostly investor protection agreements rather than trade agreements. There are trade elements in them, but this is mostly about investor protection. Investor protection of 
property rights of investors, of prerogatives of investors, of IP of investors, of the regulatory environment uh, of investors, and so forth. Recognizing that, we have some reasons to support some of these issues, but a lot of reasons for worry. Because it's not true that everything that is in the investor's interest is in the worker's interest. It's not true that everything that's in the investor's interest is in the broad interest of the American people or the people in host countries where American investment may be going or in the same way investment that could be coming into this country. So we're talking about mainly investment rules uh, and trade, which is already quite liberalized in the straightforward trade manner, doesn't change all that much from what we know of these treaties. These are basically not trade agreements. They're basically investment agreements. Second point is that I see no evidence that these proposed arrangements focus on the great challenges of sustainable development, which I believe to be the core challenges of our time. By sustainable development, I mean the triple challenge of economic improvement, social inclusion, and environmental sustainability. These treaties do not focus on the challenges of poverty. They do not focus on challenges of inequality of income and its sharp rise in the last generation and its continuing rise even in recent years nor do they focus on the issues of the environment, except perhaps in a negative way, I would say. There is purportedly to be an environmental standard here, but I worry more that investor prerogatives will be given preference over environmental needs, and there's very little to really give us confidence that environmental issues are at the forefront. If they were, I'm sure that most of the supporters of these agreements on the Republican side would uh, be against them for all the wrong reasons. Uh, but uh, the fact that they're so enthusiastic is because there's very little protection and need for the environmental issues. A third point which has become notorious in these agreements, which I think is notorious correctly, is the whole issue of investor state dispute settlement. And to my mind, it is quite alarming that the administration seems until this day to be pushing something which more and more observers, participants, legal scholars view as out of control. So as I'm sure that most or all of you know, uh, there is an investor state uh, dispute a settlement mechanism uh, proposed in both TPP and TTIP. And the problem with this is that it creates a, a extra legal venue for arbitration that has proven in many uh, uh, investment treaties in recent years uh, to be uh, highly deleterious for basic government regulatory processes, and especially around issues of health, safety, environment, uh, and other issues. The idea is essentially that this uh, new mechanism, uh, or the mechanism proposed here, which is uh, already part of many bilateral investment treaties and, and uh, uh, some multilateral investment treaties, is giving more and more power to investors to challenge general government regulatory actions, not breach of specific investment contracts, but general regulatory and <coughs> legislative actions on the claim that those general regulatory or legislative actions are against the interests of the investors and somehow therefore violate the uh, implicit standards or guarantees that these investors have vis-a-vis -vis the host countries. In other words, standards of general applicability against 
uh, smoking or, or uh, for environmental protection or for taxation of natural resources and so forth are now coming under challenge in these uh, investor state dispute arbitration panels and forcing governments, the host governments, to back down or rescind or in the face of uh, a lost arbitration uh, to uh, cancel laws of general applicability and therefore to lose the sovereign right to pursue the national interest at the face of investor interest. Well, you can imagine why America's most powerful multinational companies would like such an arrangement. Uh, and this is the sense in which this is the sense in which uh, these treaties really are investor treaties first, and trade treaties uh, a, a, a distant second. This investor state dispute clause has been widely attacked. Uh, it is uh, the German government has spoken out uh, strongly uh, uh, with strong reservations about it. Legal scholars across the United States uh, more and more are expressing alarm at how uh, these clauses have gotten out of hand, given absolutely unjustified and dangerous power to investors vis-a-vis -vis the state. Yet as far as I know, and since I'm not an insider to this, I don't know for sure, but as far as I know, the United States government continues to press this clause till today. I regard that alone as reason to oppose <coughs> both of these treaties. If this remains in place, it is absolutely in the wrong direction. Uh, and these clauses have proven to be increasingly dangerous, and we've heard, at least I've seen publicly, no response to this at all. Fourth, as the Congresswoman rightly stressed, this entire process is non-transparent. And this is why TPA uh, should absolutely never be accepted in this context. But I think in the end, it's why both treaties, uh, or both uh, uh, partnership agreements, uh, uh, are likely to go down as well because the idea that the administration is just going to present a completed document to the, to the public and then basically say, even if there isn't a TPA formally, well, take it or leave it, we can't really negotiate this, is in the end, I believe, going to be politically toxic and uh, for all the understandable reasons. I don't understand how something of such vast significance for billions of people could even presume to be treated in this manner. One could imagine that negotiations over very specific tariff rates or very specific uh, numerical clauses in some of uh, these chapters could be held privately. But the idea that the main text around issues as broad as uh, investor protection, dispute settlement, uh, taxation, financial flows, intellectual property would be done secretly is shocking, actually, to me. If it were purely an issue of quantification of a specific tariff for a six-digit uh, SITC code sector, it's understandable, perhaps, that in a give and take, uh, one would uh, not have the numbers published day by day. But we're talking about the basic rules of the international economy for the three major regions of the world. There is no reason in the world I can see for this text not to be public, not to be publicly vetted, and not to be updated over time. And the fact that it isn't is a huge tactical mistake, in my opinion, of the administration anyway but makes it untenable for us to give support for this process. Finally, there is, as far as I could see, not one single analysis by the administration. And, of course, 
none in detail by anybody else because we don't know about the costs and benefits and implications of these proposed agreements. What would they mean? What would the implications be for jobs, sectors, income distribution, growth, trade? Not that economics is up to the task of giving precise answers to that, but still, before launching into uh, such a potentially uh, large and disruptive set of arrangements, one does an analysis of what it means. And I don't see any evidence, I don't even see the case that the administration is making except on general principles, which I don't find compelling for the reasons I've, for the reasons I've explained uh, about what the consequences would be. So how could we actually proceed without some sense of quantification and analysis of the basic implications? I think the answer is we could not uh, proceed in that way. So my, my recommendation is that uh, there should be proposed by uh, members of the Congress uh, a statement of principles uh, that are a, a baseline for going ahead. Uh, on, on this, uh, and I would include uh, the following. First, that the interim draft should be posted and uh, further drafts uh, should be available for public comment. This is a basic standard of, uh, uh, of, of uh, functioning good governance. Second, that the administration is committed to providing a detailed, uh, quantified analysis of the implications of these two treaties and one that will be made available sufficiently ahead of time for commentary and for additional uh, analyses by uh, other interested parties. Third, that trade and investment agreements of the 21st century identify the primacy of the goals. The goals are not process, the goals are not to strengthen investor rights. The goals should be goals of job creation in the signatory countries, good living standards for workers, environmental protection, including facing the major challenges of climate change and loss of biodiversity, <coughs> and assistance and distributive policies to help those who would be losers in what otherwise potentially is a winning hand for all of the countries involved. Those are basic standards, it seems to me, that need to be acknowledged, recognized, and put forward. And then the actual agreement can be tested against those standards. Does this agreement actually fulfill those needs? Fourth, I would say, should be a clear statement about the primacy of every country's sovereign right and responsibility to pursue sustainable development over specific clauses of trade and investment that might be agreed. Just so that there's no misunderstanding, these agreements must not stand in the way of effectively addressing climate change, for example, which is the largest environmental issue that humanity has ever faced and yet it's quite conceivable that there would be barriers to effective regulation on climate change as a result of the TTIP and the TPP. And unless there's a clear statement about the need for sovereign governments to have responsibility and for trade and investment rules not to impede taking basic measures for public health, for environment, and for the general public welfare, then I, I would say that we face huge risks. Fifth, in, in that same regard, either the investor state dispute settlement provision is dropped altogether, or it is dramatically limited in scope and application in line with many recommendations that have been made by the legal community, by exhaustion clauses uh, on uh, state law, uh, as uh, some uh, German uh, government officials proposed, and so on. And that 
that proposed new uh, provision should be scrutinized carefully by the legal community and by the practitioner community. But in general, I believe that the investor state dispute settlement law should be dropped from these agreements. And sixth, I would uh, also urge that these treaties be uh, analyzed from the point of view of international taxation. We have a utter crisis of corporate irresponsibility and the loopholes that we're seeing play out day by day, with tax inversions, uh, with the, all of the uh, incredible manipulations of our leading companies, Apple and Google and Starbucks and others, uh, our marquee names uh, who have figured out how to use the international uh, legal structure to avoid paying taxes that are rightly due. And I believe that these two new treaties of partnership of proposals could further undermine international taxation. And I would put a special uh, look <laughs> on that because this is a crisis and it's gutting our capacity uh, as a country to function and to address the needs that I've been emphasizing. So those are my suggestions and I thank you very much. Several times in your speech, you said that the agreements are investment agreements, essentially. This means basically freer mobility of capital that will result. So I guess my question to you is, as a, if you were a legislator, what safeguards would you look for in the actual agreements that will essentially hedge us from potential cri financial crisis stemming from a capital account deficit? Uh, there are uh, two main kinds of uh, financial uh, flows. Uh, one is foreign direct investment, which is generally long-term, more stable, and uh, aimed at uh, operations overseas. And the other is portfolio investment, uh, which is much more volatile and really the source of a lot of the financial crises in uh, the last 25 years. Uh, most of our serious financial crises, like 2008 or Asia 1997, are sudden, uh, dramatic liquidity crises which come from panics. Uh, Lehman Brothers uh, induced uh, the 2008 panic, the bot devaluation in, in 1997 uh, induced the Asian panic. And as soon as those panics uh, break out, then the interbank lines of credit dry up, short-term liquidity dries up, and economies are pushed into an extremely deep crisis. International capital flows are especially vulnerable. They dry up uh, very, very quickly. That's why from September 14, 2008 until around September 18, 2008, in one week, the entire world economy was brought into the Wall Street crisis. It was the 
most dramatic global scale financial crisis we've ever seen. And, uh, well, certainly the fastest because even the Great Depression rolled out over the course of two years uh, with the bank failures, whereas this dried up international liquidity in one week. I'm quite sure this is not being addressed uh, in, uh, in, in uh, this treaty making uh, because there's just very weak governance about these issues in general. Uh, and the economics profession is not so good on these issues uh, because mainstream macroeconomics isn't about this. Uh, and there's a lot to say but the idea that we just push for liberalization of cross-border finance without due regard for the safeguards needed for liquidity crises would be adding fuel to this fire. Uh, and so there are many questions about how long-term foreign direct investment should be handled. That goes to questions of income distribution, labor standards, environment standards, and so forth, the things I talked about the short-term portfolio flow, to the extent that that is pushed in these treaties, for example, general clauses that uh, that uh, capital markets uh, should be liberalized. We don't know. I don't know what's in these clauses, but if that were the the nature of uh, of these clauses, it would add danger and uh, and fragility to the world markets rather than stability. To get stability, one would need uh, a uh, rather thorough, uh, which we're not going to get from this administration or in this context, a rather thorough structure, bulwark, to be able to both prevent and face these liquidity crises. But after 2008, we did not make uh, any deep reforms on international financial liquidity management, I would say, only very ad hoc measures, and they won't be part of this treaty. It's too complicated. Uh, so this treaty may be neutral on this subject, possibly negative by just opening up more without the safety net underneath it, but it will not be positive and constructive on this. Uh, Randy Mendoza with the Office of Congressman with Susan Davis. Kind of a follow-up. Given the uh, stance that you want the most amount of um, nimbleness with regards to responding to financial crises, liquidity crises, would you advise against including currency measures in a trade agreement? Yeah. I, you know, I, I am not a great fan of the uh, currency manipulation measures myself, just because I know from 35 years of work in international finance that one country's currency manipulation is another country's monetary policy and vice versa. And the standards of what this means are, uh, in my view, not uh, so easily defined. Some of my best friends in Congress view otherwise, so uh, I I'm, uh, don't, don't want to push the point uh, too hard, except to say that I, I do not believe that these are the places for the currency issues to be resolved. I think that a reformed international monetary system and using the institutions of the Bretton Woods, uh, especially the IMF uh, framework, is the place where those issues should be taken up. There was good reason in 1944 to vest the exchange rate issues there. Things have gotten a lot more complicated <coughs> since 1944. Then it was just trying to think about how to reopen uh, an international monetary system. Now we're managing a, and not managing well, a global financial market of trillions of dollars of transactions per day. And so in this sense, we're not up to it yet. That's why we have these very deep uh, periodic crises and do not believe they're under control. Uh, this has been, uh, I've been working in, in, in those uh, fields for more than three decades, and we have not made institutional progress um, on this in a, in a deep way. I, wouldn't, I personally wouldn't put it in here. It's just not the place to, to handle this, in my opinion. Uh, 
and we need a multilateral framework to handle exchange rate issues when it's purely done in a bilateral way. It's easy for the two to say, you're unfair, you're too weak, you're too weak, you're manipulating, you're manipulating, and I, I think in the end it's actually not so fruitful. In general, it's disappointing that after the 2008 crisis, um, we didn't have a major, clear uh, sense of overhaul of these issues. They're not easy, but they were beyond the reach. And I'm going to, uh, Roger, can we make it a, a, a quick how are you? And because I'm going to get on to the next panel, so you go ahead. I don't know. Roger Hickey, Campaign for America's Future. Thank you for being here. Thank you for speaking out, especially in this place. Uh, thanks for your five points of, of disagreement. Can you tell us what you think these two treaties' uh, impact would be on the ballooning U.S. trade deficit? No, uh, <laughs> because I haven't seen the treaties. Uh, and uh, I really feel that it's very hard to give a quantification uh, on that. On general principles, uh, I would say that uh, these treaties will continue to underpin the kind of globalization process that is underway right now. So they will not change direction, but amplify the current direction. I'm not against all aspects of uh, the globalization, I have to say. And I, I do believe, by the way, in uh, foreign direct investment, international production systems, cross-border uh, investment, and so forth. And I see it also as a way for poor countries to develop. But I am completely against the kind of uh, uh, arrangement we have now. In fact, it's my great disappointment because I helped to bring globalization uh, through my own uh, efforts and, and advisory work over the years. And I always envisioned that when we move to a global system, we would move to a humane, decent global system that would recognize losers as well as winners, that would maintain standards of redistribution, that would focus on the poor, that would address uh, market failures like environmental crises and financial crises. But our general mode of globalization has been to ignore all of the downsides and to plow ahead on emphasizing investor rights. And this is not surprising because we're a lobby-led uh, government structure. Uh, and so you see what you get if you put the pharmaceutical industry or the financial sector or the other sectors as heads of the negotiations. You get narrow interests and you don't face the broader challenge. So while I can't give a number on uh, the trade deficit, I would say that the kind of globalization we have right now, which in some ways expands the, the pie but does so at the high cost to the poor, to, the, uh, to, to many poor, to rising inequality, to uh, more frequent financial crises and to a growing environmental catastrophe. Nothing that I know of these two treaties would do anything but continue us along that course, perhaps accelerate it. These are not 21st century treaties that start out with our goals. These are 20th century treaties of continuing to build the flawed globalization that we have underway. Thank you very, very much, Professor Sachs. I wanted to say thank you for really setting up the structure, which is uh, the topics for the, the next panel that will, will join us. Uh, and with Garrett Bernstein and Income Inequality, we are going to be talking about, about the investor state issue, and we're going to be talking about later uh, and, the, and the environment. But thank you for the clarity of thought and of it to us set us off this morning.
getting settled. I do want to acknowledge um, my other colleagues, uh, Congressman George Miller, uh, who extended the invitation along with me, could not be here this morning. Uh, we will seek uh, Congresswoman Schakowsky in a bit, uh, Congressman Pocan, uh, but a whole num a host of members who have been engaged and involved in this effort. Uh, it's, a, it's a busy week, it's a short week, and they're cramming everything they could possibly cram into it uh, in order to get out next, uh, by the end of next week. So, um, let me, um, I do have the pleasure of introducing this panel, uh, and we're going to talk about the impact of the partnership on goals as a nation, on the economy and society. Uh, Jared Bernstein, who is a senior fellow at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, will give us an overview of how past and present trade agreements affect job creation and income equality in America. Uh, before joining CBPP, uh, Jared served for two years as Chief Economist and Economic <coughs> Advisor to Vice President Biden, Executive Director of the White House Task Force of the Federal Middle Class, and a member of President Obama's economic team. He is well versed in the issues of income and equality, mobility, employment, earning trends, housing trends, federal and state economic fiscal policies. And I'm grateful that you're here with us this morning, Jared. Uh, also joining us is Attorney General Janet Mills of Maine. Um, who is going to talk about the impact on investor state disputes. Um, and before becoming Maine's first woman attorney general in 2008, um, uh, uh, the attorney general served in the Maine House of Representatives as an assistant attorney general as well. This year she joined 42 other state attorney generals in expressing to the U.S. Trade Representative her opposition to any provision in the TPP that would undermine states' ability to regulate tobacco. And we thank you for that. And we also have Thea Lee, Deputy Chief of Staff of the AFL-CIO, and someone who has done significant research on NAFTA. She's going to talk about how TPP and other previous trade agreements like NAFTA affect labor uh, and the environment. And Thea has served as Policy Director, Chief International Economist um, at the AFL-CIO, as well as International Trade Economist with the Economic Policy Institute. Thank you. Uh, all for being here, and Jared, I'm going to ask you to get started. I'm going to be brief, but I'm going to stand here so I can see people who I can't see when I'm sitting there. So thank you very much, uh, Congressman, for inviting me and uh, for holding the forum. Um, in, a, in, in five to seven minutes, I want to talk about uh, the, uh, um, uh, amplify some of the points and, uh, that uh, Jeff made, I thought, uh, so um, uh, trenchantly and effectively. Uh, although I, I have a strong disagreement with one point on, on, on the uh, currency chapter, um, uh, which I will emphasize. Uh, but I want to, so I want to talk about uh, uh, the role of uh, trade agreements and trade deficits, something Roger Hickey asked about a second ago, uh, and the relationship between these issues and income inequality, and then say a word about fiscal concerns, because I think there's a linkage there that's really important, and we are in a, a building where fiscal concerns uh, loom large. Um, I strongly uh, view uh, TPP without a currency chapter, one that clearly disallows uh, currency management or manipulation uh, as a, an export subsidy, as a non-tariff barrier. Such a, such a trade agreement should always be opposed, and uh, uh, particularly strongly in this case. And, I, I really try to avoid arguing with people who aren't here to argue back, and Jeff is a very capable arguer, and I, but I think he's left. Uh, so I'll make sure to follow up with him on this myself, because I want to give him the opportunity to, to argue with me about this. But in fact, what I kind of heard him saying is it wouldn't work. And uh, frankly, it, what we're doing now is important. Uh, I, I believe uh, uh, it would help, uh, but if it didn't, we'd be no worse off. Uh, so the idea of... Uh, this, if there is going to be a TPP, the idea of, of, of not uh, taking that opportunity to uh, have a chapter that uh, um, uh, prohibits, creates mechanisms by which uh, currency management is disallowed would be um, uh, not only a missed opportunity, but would be a completely unacceptable uh, path in my view. Why? Why? What, what's so darn important about that? Well, I'm going to get to that, but I want to tie it to uh, the issue of, of, of income inequality, which is something that Congressman Loro asked me to speak to. Uh, uh, in given, given time, I won't show you, uh, uh, this is a rare, for, rare, rare presentation for me because I'm not using slides. And I won't show you the slide that I throw up here, which basically shows the um, uh, uh, income distribution, if you were, just uh, how, how low, high, and middle incomes have done over the past uh, 
um, oh, 60, 70 years. And if you look uh, between the mid 40s and say the mid 70s, you actually had incomes growing together, low, middle, high. They just about doubled in every case. Family incomes doubled at the bottom, believe it or not, used to happen, uh, doubled at the middle, and doubled at the top. So uh, growing together, as it were, in those years. Uh, since then, um, of course, they've really uh, separated a great deal. Now, what does this have to do with trade? Well, two things. First of all, the balance of trade in the period when incomes were growing together was about zero on average. That is, uh, the trade deficit of share of GDP was about zero, uh, maybe slightly positive, over that initial period. Over that latter period, say the last 30 or 40 years, uh, the uh, trade deficit has been on average about 3% negative, 3% of GDP. Um, and most recently, uh, uh, trade deficits were in the four to 500 billion range in la uh, last year. Uh, so we're talking three, four percent of, of, of GDP. Uh, now, I am by no means saying that that is the only variable. You know, it's, it's a common economic mistake to say, uh, here's something that happened and here's another variable that happened at the same time. <laughs> However, they are intimately linked. And the way they're linked is very clearly through the absence of tight job markets, of full employment. Remember, this is basic Econ 101. Uh, GDP uh, is consumption plus investment plus government spending uh, plus uh, net exports. And if net exports are negative, that's a drag on GDP growth. That means less economic ac activity. And when we run these trade deficits, uh, uh, essentially we are exporting jobs abroad. Now that doesn't mean that you can't have a trade deficit uh, 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 of some magnitude year in and year out. Uh, it happens. Um, but the idea that um, uh, we've run substantial deficits since 1976 uh, is a suggestion that something is deeply imbalanced in global accounts. So the uh, relationship, just to be clear, the relationship between, um, uh, I think, between uh, uh, trade and, and inequality runs through um, uh, uh, less uh, slower growth. Uh, weaker labor markets, the absence of full employment, and the re relationship between that and trade agreements, or TPP, has to do with uh, um, some of our trading partners who manage the dollar. This is not a secret. Who, uh, in fact, I like to call it management versus manipulation, because manipulation sounds so uh, secretive and uh, you know like some sort of evil plot. No, it's uh, if you plot uh, the Chinese currency against the U.S. dollar, it's really straight for a while, and then it wiggles about. This is what you can do on the FRED database in about 30 seconds. So let's call that management because it's not really a secret. Uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, um, uh, the idea of, of dealing with that in a trade deal like the TPP is one that I think many uh, opponents of the agreement support. And most recently, I read a paper written uh, just uh, a few months ago by Fred Bergsten. Uh, uh, at uh, uh, PIIE, and, 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 and you know, certainly no rabid uh, opponents of, of trade. And I thought it was an excellent piece of work, and it was uh, precisely about the need for a currency chapter, and even articulating how that chapter would work. So, um, in the, I, I can say more about these relationships uh, during Q&A, including some ideas as to uh, um, what you might do to, uh, what you might put in such a chapter um, uh, to, um, uh, to reduce uh, the, uh, the, this export subsidy and, and import tariff. Um, uh, but let me just say briefly, the idea that I like the best, and I, this, this is, I, I say this one because I think it's sometimes surprising to people, is simply um, uh, um, legislating uh, reciprocity. That is, if uh, a country can buy our treasuries, uh, we have to be able to buy theirs. Now, you might think that, well, don't we already have that? I mean, if China goes out, if uh, Korea goes out, if Singapore goes out and buys a bunch of treasury bills in order to uh, boost the value of the dollar relative to their currency to make sure their exports to us are cheap and ours to them are more expensive, uh, can't uh, we go out and do the same thing? And the answer is no. So uh, simply having that kind of reciprocity would make a big difference. Finally, I wanted to say a word about uh, fiscal concerns. Uh, the, it's funny, uh, when, when I think about this uh, question of fiscal policy, especially in recent years when we've had a weak economy, I really think it's like, uh, what's that movie, Honey, I, I Shrunk the Kids? You know, Honey, I Shrunk the Wrong Deficit. Uh, our focus on, the, uh, uh, on shrinking the budget deficit in a time of, of, of a weak uh, private sector economy that's called austerity has been a complete uh, 
um, uh, has, has been a, a very serious problem and, and a major contributor to what's been a pretty weak recovery relative to targeting the trade deficit. And one of the reasons uh, that comes to mind is because, in fact, uh, I've tried to make these connections between the trade deficit and weak, uh, uh, weaker growth, the absence of full employment. When we've actually um, had uh, a better fiscal outlook in the latter 1990s, for example, um, one of the things that helped us get there was full employment. Now, you might be saying, but well, we had trade deficits then, Jared. And the fact is, we did. And we offset them with a bubble, just like we offset them with a bubble in the, in the 2000s. If you're running a trade deficit of that magnitude, you either have to offset it with a bubble, with a big budget deficit, or you have to live with uh, a higher unemployment. On the fiscal front where the TPP really comes in, and this is from a paper by Paul Vanderwater, which he wrote for uh, the Center on Budget where I work, um, uh, the uh, uh, concern there is that the TPP would restrict Medicare's ability to limit the prices it pays for um, uh, say Part B uh, beneficiaries by allowing drug companies to challenge some of the payment policies uh, that now hold down the costs of, uh, of, um, uh, of drug purchases. Uh, the TPP uh, could raise health costs by expanding patent protections uh, for both drugs and medical devices. Uh, this is all in the, in the Vanderwater paper. And the TPP could give companies a, an avenue to challenge um, uh, policies that the U.S. is trying to pursue to actually control these costs. I mean, our fiscal health in the future goes um, uh, directly through the kinds of cost controls that we're trying to build into the Affordable Care Act and uh, uh, hopefully into the stronger negotiating for lower medical prices uh, that comes from uh, the government uh, uh, as, a, uh, as a single payer in the case of say, Medicare or Medicaid. The TPP threatens to block that and uh, I think one should have great fiscal concerns about those outcomes. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Jana Mills. I am the Attorney General of the State of Maine. And I'm pleased to be here. Thank you for inviting me, Congressman, uh, Congresswoman Royal. And uh, I, I practiced law for 38 years civil and criminal. I was previously the elected district attorney for three counties for 15 years. Uh, and I'm in my third year as Maine's attorney general. Um, also served six years previously in, in Maine legislature. Maine is very proud of being ahead of the curve when it comes to consumer protection laws, when it comes to protection of our natural resources, labor management relations, at least up until recently, and health and safety regulations. As the chief legal officer and the chief law enforcement officer for our state, uh, I'm troubled by the impact of international treaties which threaten the ability of our states to uh, regulate activities in our jurisdictions and to enforce our duly enacted laws to, pr to protect the public interest. Everything we've done for the last 60 years is threatened by certain trade agreements that are negotiated in secret, adopted without amendment, and enforced without fairness. This backdoor bartering is selling states' rights down the drain. It is risking the public safety regulations we've had in place for decades, with the additional risk of losing more American jobs, losing market share, losing business, losing dollars and cents to other countries. Chapter 11 of the North American Free, Free Trade Agreement has become the model for other trade agreements, unfortunately, provi providing a procedure for investors based in other countries to challenge state laws and regulations. The investor state dispute uh, <coughs> settlement, uh, uh, procedure you've heard about. Um, and regulations that affect the investor's way of doing business here can be challenged. Even so far as to challenge state court judgments, maybe federal court judgments for all we know, in a way that is wholly unavailable to United States citizens or to businesses uh, based in our country. The U.S. Trade Representative has stated that investor state arbitration is very important to the negotiation of trade treaties. He claims that arbitration provides investors in foreign countries with such basic legal protections. He assures the public that the United States and its foreign partners will continue to enforce regulations in the public interest. I am not as confident. Recent history makes me suspicious. The Conference of Chief Justices, judges from across the country who rarely dabble in trade policy, are also suspicious. 
They passed a resolution two months ago <coughs> urging Congress and the U.S. Trade Representative not to allow foreign investors any greater substantive and procedural rights than those that United States citizens and businesses have. Last year, that same group of distinguished jurists was so concerned about the sovereignty of state judicial systems that they passed a resolution asking Congress and the Trade rep Representative to ensure that trade agreements recognize the right of state courts to regulate the admission and performance of lawyers in their own jurisdictions. Really? How could something so fundamental as the licensing and supervision of attorneys by the states suddenly be of such a concern to our state court judges, the highest co court judges in our states? Something is terribly amiss with our globalization agenda. In my own state, our main Citizen Trade Policy Commission, which has been in existence for 10 years now, it's a bipartisan commission. They recently looked at the effect of trade agreements on agriculture. Contemplating the proposed <coughs> Transatlantic Trade Investment Partnership, TTIP, and the proposed Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, now being negotiated without public input, as has been mentioned, folks in Maine have expressed deep concerns about our ability to protect to protect food safety regulations, public pro procurement programs that favor locally grown foods, for instance, geographic, geographical indications, or GIs, which brand products such as Maine Lobster, based on their place of origin and their reputation for quality, and even our state's milk price supports program, which sustains our dairy farmers. All states should, con should share these concerns, and not only for farmers. In a 2012 assessment, our same bipartisan Maine Citizen Trade Policy Commission expressed urgent concerns about the enforcement of our tobacco laws, pharmaceutical pricing and marketing, and general government procurement regulations. Nationally, we attorneys general have led the fight against big tobacco to protect the public health. The Master Tobacco Settlement a a a Agreement of 1998 created new protections regarding marketing tobacco to children and other advertising abuses. We're all familiar with that now. It's become part of our culture. Banning tobacco, that Joe Camel and all that kind of thing. We banned it. State and local regulations also target tobacco in licensing, taxation, and minimum age for purchasing products, retail display regulations, fire safety standards, minimum prices, and more recently, indoor smoking regulations. All of these important public health protections, I believe, are in jeopardy because of various trade agreements either now in effect or now being negotiated. These concerns are not mere, merely hypothetical. Cigarette manufacturers and individual countries are, have challenged the Master Settlement Agreement and related laws and bans on tobacco flavoring in NAFTA-sponsored arbitrations, requiring extensive litigation and expenditure of a great deal of state and federal time and resources. These challenges defy the intent and purpose of the Master Settlement Agreement, and they undermine our deep-seated interest in protecting youth from dangerous tobacco products. For that reason, I joined 48 other attorneys general, 48 including myself, I guess, this past January in a letter to the, uh, urging the U.S. Trade Representative to preserve the historic achievements of the Master Settlement Agreement, as well as the important federal prerogatives of the 2009 Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act, which prohibits misleading labeling and advertising, and which gives the FDA broad enforcement and regulatory authority over tobacco products. We are most concerned about the investor state provisions of trade agreements that are intended to ward off protectionist policies that harm exports and harmonize regulations among the member of nations. That's the word they use in that harmonize. I love it. Sounds like a chorus. At the same time, however, they give these provisions give private industries certain unique and extraordinary avenues to obtain relief from governmental regulations that might affect their profits. These dispute res resolution mechanisms are entirely outside the legal systems of the countries involved, and they are conducted under standards that are different from those applied in our courts. We have no say, no control in them. Invoking these arbitration provisions, provisions recently, one major drug company contested the ability of a Canadian court to find unlawful and misleading a patent for one of the company's drugs, claiming that the, the, the company claimed that the court decision affected the company's bottom line in violation of a multinational trade agreement. It was 
That matter is still pending, but it serves as a danger signal that these unusual arbitrations could well jeopardize the historic rights and sovereignty of the nations and of the states within them. In today's global economy, it is important that the United States become a good trading partner with the European Union and with Asian countries, and that treaties be forcefully negotiated and respected with the interests of our national economy in the forefront. These negotiations, however, should be conducted transparently and without risk to the important public health and safety concerns and interests embodied in decades of our state and federal laws. Our citizens expect no less. Thank you. join us for this wonderful conversation. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here. The invitation of Rosa DeLauro and George Miller, and also to share an event with Professor Jeff Sachs, Jared, Janet, and uh, the others who will speak uh, on the next panel. Jeff and Jared and Janet, look at that, the J's, I think I should rename myself, uh, laid out the broad likely impact of TPP on wages and equality investment, what the big picture is in the context of our current economy where we are and what we need. And if you look at it, if you step back, and I think that's really what I want to do this morning, is take a couple steps back, because we all get embroiled in the trade debate. We all enter our usual kind of knee-jerk places, and then we dismiss each other. We don't, we're talking past each other. But I think uh, certainly Jeff Sachs raised a lot of issues that were fresh this morning. But if you say the labor market is weak, it is staggering. After five years into our economic recovery, we have high unemployment, uh, high long-term unemployment in particular, and particularly among certain groups within the economy. We have inequality reaching grotesque levels, as Jared and Jeff Sachs both po pointed out. And we have corporations amassing both economic and political power at the national level and at the global level in an unprecedented way, you know, pushed along by corporate finance changes and other things, but I think we all can agree, and we can see that dynamic, that power begets more power. And that's certainly one of the points that Jeff Sachs made about secrecy benefiting those who are in power. And I, so if you say, what do we need today? What kind of trade policies do we need today? Do we need policies that will exacerbate inequality, <coughs> further empower multinational corporations over communities, and weaken our democracy? Well, I can answer that question. No, that's not the way we need to go. We need to think differently about what we're asking from our trade policy, what we want, and whether this agreement, uh, TPP and TTIP, are going to fix, uh, address those concerns. And of course, we start out from the point that TPP does not exist yet. It's being negotiated. Um, and theoretically, it's still fixable. And I think that's an important point, certainly for us in the labor movement. If we can fix it, we want to fix it. We want to use our voices to make this a better agreement. We know we're going to have to live in the world that results from it. But the truth is, the negotiations have been going on for almost six years, and they now involve a dozen countries. And even though many issues are still not resolved, we do know that our government has already put on the table its negotiating language in most of the areas that concern us. And it's inadequate. It's just not right. They're not on the right track. They haven't stepped back. This is not, there's no innovation, there's no creativity, there's no new thought that has gone into this. And the problem is, too, that the language our government puts on the table in many areas is the high water mark. It only gets worse from there. And I don't know about you, but I've seen a lot of these trade negotiations, and I've never seen our government go back and improve its language after it's been put on the table. And in, in many cases, it gets worse because you know what happens when the, the, agree the negotiations are tough, which these are, and they can't reach agreement. It's the middle of the night when um, deals are made and, and uh, concessions are made. And my experience on this is that I can already feel the bus tracks on the back of my shoulders because who gets thrown under the bus when it's, you need that last minute deal? You've promised you're going to wrap up the deal by this year. And it is often um, us who get uh, the shaft in that case. But labor and environmental groups have submitted literally hundreds of pages of recommendations, concrete, specific recommendations on how to fix this trade deal. We took this seriously. We believe in it. We wanted it to be better. 
and I have to say very, very few have been incorporated into the text that the U.S. government has put on the table. And that is um, a bad sign. And it's true that there have been lots of consultations, and some of you, particularly congressional staff, may have heard uh, Ambassador Froman or others say they have spent hours and hours meeting with labor and environmental stakeholders, and it's true. And I so appreciate the time, the courtesy, and the professionalism of the U.S. Trade Representative's Office. It's great. But at the end of the day, we are not keeping score of the number of hours of consultation. We want to see our ideas and our perspective reflected in the actual agreement, and that is where this falls short. So if we step back, as Professor Sachs said, and say, what, what do we need from trade policy in the year 2014? We want good jobs at good wages. We want respect for international workers' rights, both here in the United States and in our trading partners. We want something approaching reciprocal or balanced trade, as Jared pointed out. And we need to think about what are the incentives that would support, encourage, reward uh, companies that put good jobs in the United States, pay decent wages, <coughs> abide by international standards and U.S. laws, so that we can have, what do they call it, the insourcing or the restoring or the support for current producers of both goods and services. We want healthy communities. And we want regulatory structures that both preserve our democratic decision-making processes, as Janet said, but also the integrity of the consumer, the labor, the environment, and the public health protections that we have in place. We don't need a trade agreement to tell us we need to weaken our environmental protections or our consumer protections or our labor protections. We don't need that. We have a political system. It's called democracy. It's called the Congress. It's called the, the branches of the U.S. government. And so why do we put ourselves in a position where a foreign unaccountable international dispute settlement panel that we have no access to, that we have no control over, is going to undermine the decisions we made in our own democracy. We also need domestic policies that support uh, these kinds of incentives. We need to invest in infrastructure and skills. That's a domestic question, not an international question. And we need to uh, support government purchases and a tax code, as Jeff and, uh, and Jared said, that reward good jobs at home and reward good behavior of companies. We haven't done any of that. So we haven't put the domestic policies in place that would support a competitive U.S. economy in the 21st century. And we've put in place trade deals, we're negotiating trade deals, that actually undermine our democracy and that undermine our ability to provide good jobs at home. So Jared and, uh, talked about currency, and I agree with Jared on this one. I disagree with Professor Sachs. Running chronic trade deficits with trade partners that intervene systematically, one-sidedly, into currency markets to create a, a, a competitive advantage for their producers and a competitive disadvantage for our producers simply doesn't make any sense. In an ideal world, the international uh, trade system, the WTO or the IMF, would take this on. They haven't done it. They're incapable of doing it or unwilling to do it. It doesn't matter. They haven't done it. So if we're going to sign a trade agreement with a third of the world, can't we start there? Shouldn't we have some provisions in place so that we're not opening our market to countries that have not agreed to stop manipulating their currency? So why does it, how do we negotiate a reduction in tariffs and a discipline on subsidies and have nothing to say about currency? Which is the same thing at the end of the day. It's equivalent, as Jared said. If you allow your trading partner to manipulate its currency with respect to your currency, it is as though they just put a 40% tariff on all your products. Why do you negotiate the reduction of tariffs with one hand and then pretend you have nothing to say about currency? It doesn't make sense. Second of all, on investment, and Janet covered this really beautifully, and as did um, Professor Sachs. The Cato Institute, you all know Cato, the Libertarian uh, Institute, has called the investor state dispute settlement a government subsidy for risk-averse corporations that want protection for their overseas investments. That is the way to look at the investor state. You have a company that wants to move abroad, but it's worried that maybe they won't be treated fairly in foreign courts. That's a worry. I would have that worry. But why is it the job of the U.S. government to make it easier and more profitable for our companies to move our jobs overseas? 
Let's use our capital, our negotiating capital at the negotiating table to protect good jobs for American workers and not profits of companies that want to move overseas. Doesn't make sense. On procurement, uh, Rosa DeLauro mentioned uh, Buy America policies. This is some of the, these are some of the most popular policies we have in place where we use the power of government purchases either to create good jobs at home or to promote certain policies, environmental recycling, or minority set-asides, or small businesses. We use our government tax dollars for all sorts of reasons. And yet, when we enter into trade negotiations, it is understood that we're going to limit our ability to use that. We are the United States of America. We spend a lot of money on government purchases. Why shouldn't we use government purchases to create good jobs at home? The American people want it. Um, it, it's in, unpopular in trade negotiations, it's unpopular with uh, our trade negotiators. But it is something that most countries do, and we are systematically um, chipping away at our ability to do that. The labor chapter. Labor, this is really important, that we, since NAFTA, we've had a big debate in this country about using trade agreements to protect the internationally agreed upon rights of workers. Uh, freedom of association, the right to bargain collectively, and prohibitions against child labor, forced labor, and discrimination in employment. We have, it, we have inserted ever stronger labor chapters into our trade agreements, and I'm proud of the progress that we've made since NAFTA in doing that. We now have those commitments in the core of the trade agreements, and they're subject to the same dispute settlement as the rest of the provisions, the commercial provisions. And yet, they aren't good enough. And we know they're not good enough because you can look around the world and you can see that there are countries with whom we have these agreements and we are not able to enforce uh, the core workers' rights, either because the government lacks the will to do it. It's been six years since we filed a Guatemala labor rights case where uh, workers are being murdered for organizing uh, unions, for trying to um, bargain collectively. They're being murdered. The government has done nothing and it's taken our government six years to respond. That's not enough, that's not adequate. Colombia, we have a trade agreement with Colombia, we have a labor action provision, and yet we still um, are failing. So we need more resources, we need fewer lo loopholes. We have submitted a lot of ideas about how we could strengthen the labor chapter. It's not that we have to start over, it's that we need to press further, we need to do better than we've done in the past. And we need to think about what are the entry criteria, what are the baseline criteria, that a labor chapter can only do so much. You can tell a country that there's a commitment to the core labor rights, but if you have a country like Vietnam that doesn't have free, independent, democratic unions, you're not going to fix that basic thing with a chapter in a trade agreement. You need your government to say basically you know, that a country that's so egregiously out of compliance with basic labor rights really shouldn't be in these negotiations, or we need a, a much longer... Um, need a different process. So let me, um, Brunei, Malaysia, a big problem. One last problem with TPP, and that is what they call the dock on provisions, which means to, uh, that once this agreement with 12 countries uh, is, is done, any country that walks through the door uh, could in principle say, I want to join as well. And we have, and they've assured us that Congress will get a vote on, on adding additional countries, but they haven't told us, are there any Baseline criteria, does the country have to be a democracy? Does it have to have basic workers' rights and human rights? Could any country walk through the door and agree to sign on to the, the agreement that has inadequate enforcement pr protections? What are the entry criteria um, and what are the processes? So in many ways, TPP, and not counting TTIP, could be the last trade agreement we ever negotiate. Because if you have the dock on procedure, why would you negotiate a new agreement when you just bring countries into the one that's there? And this means that you know, the progress that we've made over the last couple of decades has been largely because after we finish one negotiation, we try to improve and strengthen and fix certainly the labor and environment chapters over time because we, we learn from them. It's going to be very hard to do that um, if uh, TPP becomes the dock on. And it's essentially permanent. You really need to think about it as permanent because although it is theoretically possible to abrogate a trade agreement, it has never been done. 
And so you have to assume that whatever you put in place in 2014 or 2015 is what you're going to live with. So let me just end with one little anecdote for you, or a little uh, comparison. If you are in the market for a new television set, and you think to yourself, well, the last TV I bought really didn't work out. You know, they promised I was going to have X, Y, Z, great color, great picture, great sound, great everything else. And it was a terrible television. It, you know, sparks went out when I plugged it in. I couldn't get reception. I couldn't get, the picture was blurry. I had, you know, big gray things on the, the screen. Um, and so it failed to meet the promises of the last time around. So I go back into the same store. And they tell me, I, we have a great product for you. Oh, it's much better than last time. Don't worry. Don't worry. It's not going to do anything that that last TV did. It's going to be so much better. So I say, well, can we see it? Can we take it out of the box? No. Um, can we try it? Can I plug it in? No. So you can't take it out of the box. You can't plug it in. Uh, nobody else has that TV right now. And not only that, but there are no returns. And it's the last TV you'll ever buy. Thank you very much. <laughs> take a couple of questions, but I also want to introduce our colleagues who have come in. Paul Tonko from uh, New York, Congressman Paul Tonko, Congresswoman Jane Schakowsky from Illinois, uh, and Congressman Mark Pocan uh, from Wisconsin. Uh, unbelievably uh, committed members who have been working on this issue for a long time. Um, uh, let me just ask for, um, it was great panel presentations. Thank you very, very much. Uh, uh, it, it, it just sum, summed it up beautifully. Uh, I think the, the momentum and the arguments are on our side. That's why we're going to win this, uh, uh, win this battle. We're not buying the TV. Uh, questions? And I'll ask you for short questions. Any questions for the panel? Well. Ah, that's uh, that's uh, that's wild. And we take, but I, I, let me I, I, let me finish this up. I think what Professor Sachs laid out for us, what Jeff laid out, and the issues um, that we need to be concerned about. Several of those have been discussed. We're going to go to two more, but this is the heart and soul of what this debate is about. It is about income inequality and how this affects our income inequality and job growth. It is about abrogating the regulations that our states have put together and giving sway to, um, uh, 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 to corporations and to industry uh, to take charge in these areas. And it is about uh, what happens with labor and workers' rights and how that is contributing to where we are. And as a nation, our goals have got to be preserved. We've got to lay out those goals as we walk into these trade agreements. And not just how to figure out what those goals are after these pieces are on the table. Thank you. Thank the three of you very, very much. And I'm going to ask Dan and Mark to come up and introduce our, our, our two panelists. Uh, we're going to talk uh, about the uh, 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 pharmaceutical costs and prices at, and uh, uh, AARP, and also to talk about food safety. Well, first of all, I really want to thank our champions, uh, Rosa DeLauro. We couldn't have anyone. Um, not only as, uh, as informed and uh, as uh, spirited, um, but also a great organizer. Um, and Rosa has really brought us all together to do that. And, and, and George Miller as well, what a voice. We're uh, going to miss him so much. But even now, he's still, he's still fighting. Um, and thank you so much for our panelists. This is going to be a, a fabulous panel. Um, you know, we all know that these trade agreements have uh, worldwide implications, but some of the implications that they have on our daily lives are not as well known as some of the things that, that you've heard. Many of us have been working with state legislators and expert groups on the potential health impacts, the health concerns that we have about TPP, and they're very serious. Extension of patent limits, restrictions on policies denied, uh, designed to increase affordability, 
the provision of special legal rights for large pharmaceutical companies to challenge those policies could result in significantly higher drug prices, not just overseas, but here at home as well. So I'm very excited that K.J. Hertz, a senior legislative representative from AARP, have you ever heard of them? <laughs> okay. Um, we'll, we'll be here to discuss this, uh, this issue. I've had the, uh, the privilege of working with uh, K.J. not just during his time at AARP, but when he was Deputy Director of Public Policy and Legislative Affairs at the National Association of Area Agencies on, on Aging. Um, and uh, Mark is uh, going to uh, say a few words about Debbie, and then we're going to get going on this really important panel. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jan, and again, thank you, Rosa, for putting this together. This is uh, an awesome chance for people to hear from some real experts. Uh, in this area. You know, I am a new member of Congress, but uh, I spent 14 years in our legislature and had a, a union printing business for the last 27 years um, since I've had hair. And uh, so I, I've watched over the years uh, jobs leave and go overseas uh, from the people that I buy from because uh, we help source a lot of American made and, and union made products through my business. And uh, we've watched this trade deals and what it's meant to jobs across my state of Wisconsin. And one of the areas that I think uh, really has been highlighted with these trade deals is the problems with food safety and what that means, uh, especially with Malaysia and Vietnam, uh, E. coli, drug residues, salmonella, uh, things that, uh, quite honestly, you almost never want to eat shrimp again in your life if you hear uh, some stories from Rosa. Um, I'm very careful now when I eat. Uh, but we are fortunate to have a national expert uh, when it comes to food safety. Uh, Debbie Barker is the International Programs Director for the Center for Food uh, Safety, and previously she was the co-director of the International Forum on Globalization. Uh, it's a think tank that analyzes and critiques forms of economic globalization. Uh, she worked there from 1996 to 2008. Uh, she's authored The Predictable Rise and Fall of Global Industrial Agriculture. Uh, she's authored uh, papers for the United Nations around food safety. Uh, she is the expert uh, when it comes to food safety, and it's a real honor to have Debbie Barker with us as well. So uh, that's our panel, and uh, we really appreciate your participation. Thank you. for a very kind introduction, um, and uh, thank you, Congressman DeLauro, for the invitation to speak today um, at uh, today's trade forum. Um, ARP uh, has been uh, focused on uh, the trade agreements and the TPP uh, since the latter part of last year, when we first became aware of some of the uh, real implications that these treaties could have uh, on uh, prescription drugs and our health programs here in the United States. Um, there are really three areas that are particularly worrisome uh, as we understand the current uh, TPP and the U.S. positions uh, on proposals that will affect prescription drug policies. Uh, they include drug reimbursement and public health programs, intellectual uh, property provisions on drug exclusivity and patenting, and uh, the investment state dispute settlement or ISDS process, which you've heard a lot about already. The TPP includes an annex uh, that outlines a healthcare transparency process for how pharmaceuticals should be dealt with by uh, parties to the agreement. This uh, annex is meant to provide added transparency on its surface to policy making. However, uh, it has been really heavily influenced by the pharmaceutical industry um, and provides little consideration for consumer interests uh, in terms of access to affordable medicines. These provisions, in our opinion, could adversely affect how uh, the U.S. sets payments or reimbursements for prescription drugs in Medicare or Medicaid, including a variety of mechanisms uh, to manage costs such as preferred, preferred drug lists uh, that state Medicaid programs use to encourage the use of lesser expensive generic drugs. Additionally, uh, the Medicaid program uh, requires mandated rebates 
uh, and the Part D program requires uh, um, discounts for beneficiaries from manufacturers, uh, for beneficiaries that fall into the coverage graph we're going to hold. Uh, there is the potential that these policies uh, and others that Congress <coughs> will pursue in the future could have a, to lower drug costs, um, could have to be restricted if the USTR agrees to principles <coughs> as part of this annex that would do little to ensure the availability of safe, uh, effective, and uh, safe, effective, and efficacious medicines uh, that are affordable. We also understand uh, from the USTR that this part of the agreement, this annex, would, uh, Part B would be expressly covered under this part of the, the agreement uh, and would be subject to its sort of transparency and review uh, commitments and bound by its policy restrictions. This is a particular concern because uh, there's growing evidence that the Part B payment methodology uh, for administered outpatient drugs could be improved to enhance cost containment efforts. Uh, this will take on even greater importance as the high cost of specialty drugs, including biologic medicines, will make up an increasing percentage of overall drug costs in the future. Uh, second, the U.S. is advocating for new protections uh, for biologic drugs uh, in the intellectual property chapter that would tie the United States into 12 years of data exclusivity or eight years more than is currently allowed under U.S. law. This is cause for great concern since many have advocated for shortening the uh, period of uh, market exclusivity from 12 years down to seven, uh, including President Obama and his own uh, budget proposals recently. ARP opposes any additional exclusivity for biologic medicines, whether data or market. Uh, as biosimilars become available in the United States, it is critical that Congress uh, not be tied into 12 years uh, and can pursue or, or consider policy changes that will allow these less expensive uh, file on, follow on biologic medicines to come to market sooner. We are also concerned by proposals in the intellectual property chapter that would greatly expand on minimum international standards for domestic patent protections beyond what is now included in the WTO TRIPS agreement. As we understand this proposal, it would lower the standards for patentability, uh, which could really hamper the efforts that have been made by TPP parties to curtail evergreening of patent of drug patents, uh, particularly for uh, products that do not demonstrate a clear, significant advantage or effectiveness over the reference product. Explain evergreening. Evergreening is a tactic that's uh, done by drug makers making small changes not to the active ingredient to the medicine to extend their patent period. Uh, third, uh, we have deep concerns about the ISDS process that's been mentioned before, which is part of the investment chapter, which would allow corporations to challenge countries over laws or regulations that hurt their profits. Um, ISDS uh, would allow global pharmaceutical firms to challenge mechanisms that state legislatures, the Congress, or public agencies use to manage pharmaceutical spending in public programs. For example, a pharmaceutical company could challenge a state's Medicaid preferred drug list or utilization management tools uh, that limit access to, access to a certain medicine under specific circumstances. If adopted, the President's own proposal to establish drug rebates under the Part D program for low-income beneficiaries could be subject to an ISDS challenge. <coughs> a perfect case in point, as I believe was mentioned before, is Eli Lilly's ISDS challenge under NAFTA against Canada for revoking two patents on drugs, Sotera and Zyprexa. Eli Lilly has failed to provide or has failed to demonstrate the long-term utility of these two drugs as required by Canada's patent law. As a result, Eli Lilly has filed challenges seeking $500 billion in lost profits on these two medicines. With TPP being a multilateral uh, trade agreement, the potential for more of these challenges by pharmaceutical firms over a range of policy to po to current policies that seek to contain prescription drug prices cannot be really overstated. 
As the trend of ISTS claims continues to grow and has grown significantly over recent years, the threat of these claims can be expected to have a real chilling effect on potential new laws or regulations to control the growth of drug costs and public programs. In conclusion, each of these three areas of the TPP represents a concerted effort to constrain the ability of governments to negotiate or set rational drug prices in health programs. There are policies that favor the pharmaceutical industry and, give, and fail to give equal weight to consumers' need for accessing affordable medicines. They also fail to address the need to put our public programs uh, on a more sustainable financial path. Uh, thank you very much. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much to the Congressman for uh, organizing this and to the members um, who are here and for the generous introduction and thanks for having Center for Food Safety be part of this discussion. Um, apologize if my voice is a little raspy. I think I um, over cheered for the Nats last night perhaps, but I'll we'll stick with this. Um, so we're having a very robust discussion today about trade in this room, and, and many of us are engaged. But I think it's probably fair to say that for the average American, their eyes kind of glaze over when you talk about trade, and especially trade investment. And it, 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 not many people know how it's very meaningful for their everyday lives. And um, I would submit that food issues really provide, excuse the pun, the good entree to demonstrate very concretely how trade policies are relevant to everyone um, every day. And, um, you know, uh, we talk about these, uh, well, I refer to them as our modern day trade agreements of these last few decades, the NAFTA, WTO, etc. cetera, um, that they really have little to do, as we know, with the historical role of trade, negotiating tariffs and quotas. We've covered that before. Um, and instead, they focus on what are known as non-tariff um, what negotiators call non-tariff trade barriers. But as we know, uh, you know, what they call non-tariff barriers are really um, democratically constructed social, health, food safety laws, many hard-fought gained uh, battles in this, domestically in this country, um, that are intended to safeguard our citizens. So for example, Corporations may view um, uh, food or nutritional labeling as uh, a barrier to trade if the standards are higher than corporate interests would like. Um, under TPP, for example, food labels also could be challenged as trade barriers. Um, I just also wanted to mention where um, people have been talking about the TTIP as well. Um, we just recently published this, which um, very much details um, all the threats uh, under the T, T tip, um, and a lot of them are more focused on food than perhaps are more specific than what is in the TPP. So um, there are copies out there too as well on the table. Um, um, we wanted to, uh, the Attorney General for Maine referred to the harmonizing. Um, this is a, a huge, this is a central aim of our modern day trade agreements is to harmonize differing standards between countries. And in trade speak, harmonization can be represented by various terms, regulatory coherence or convergence, mutual recognition, substantial equivalency. Um, and these terms sound rather sensible, you know, and as you say, harmonizing is usually a beautiful, you know, term. However, um, as we've seen this post WTO, NAFTA, and other trade agreements, harmonization, um, and it's as enforced through ISDS as well, really has led and leads to downward spiral of food safeguards and others as well. And perversely, these trade agreements restrict or prohibit sovereign countries from attaining higher standards that protect their citizens. I think that cannot be emphasized enough. Um, a few examples. Um, a long-standing, our meat inspection, for example, this is how it's played out. Um, a long-standing regulation of the U.S. Food Safety and Inspection Service has um, established that all imported meat had to be equal to U.S. inspection standards. 
However, after the passage of the Uruguay Round Agreement Act, precursor to WTO, the um, U.S. government, well, the USDA, FSIS, changed its regulatory language from being equal to to being equivalent. Now, this meant that the U.S. began, had to then accept meat imports from foreign countries that had substantially different standards, inspection standards, than we have in the U.S. And since then, the USDA then certified 37 nations as equivalent, including, and many of those only had one or two, one or even zero meat plants that had met our equal to standard. Um, also, this equal to versus equivalent really illustrates why it's very critical, as we all know, to have access to trade negotiating text language. Exact language and terms have very precise meanings, and they can make a radical difference in the application and the outcomes. And in the, this, we have, uh, this is how it's played out with meat inspection um, for the everyday consumer. The U.S., uh, for example, to maintain Australia's equivalency standard even after it privatized, privatized its meat inspection system. And this has resulted in repeated incidents of Australian meat imports being contaminated with fecal matter and digestive tract contents. Over a two-year period, we had about 11 import uh, incidents like this found. Um, and Australia is not the only country um, exporting meat to the U.S. Um, that exhibited problems. In 2012, the U.S. recalled 2.5 million pounds of Canadian beef products that were potentially contaminated with the E. coli virus. So this equivalent standard is also used in the TPP. Uh, the TPP would require us to allow food imports of exporting countries uh, in if they claim that their inspection is equivalent to the U.S. standard. And the, the seafood, of course, has been mentioned, and this is a particular concern with seafood, in, seafood imports. Already the USDA, the FDA inspects only 1 to 2 percent of all seafood imports for health hazards. Um, TPP would greatly increase um, seafood imports and further overwhelm U.S. inspection resources. And not to mention the environmental implications of, uh, in uh, Vietnam, for example, and other countries doing this shrimping. I mean, what it means is tearing down the mangroves, and it has it, terrible environmental uh, effects uh, contributing also, um, especially in times of climate change. Those mangroves actually guard and protect coastal lines from uh, heavy, extreme weather events. Um, also, when we talk about these trade agreements and the harmonization of uh, our food standards and other standards, the chilling effect this has is very real and something that I think we, it's hard to measure, of course, because it's all happening behind closed doors. But we have um, several, uh, we know this is happening on a daily basis when it comes to domestic standards. Um, one the thing we do know about is just even the threat of a trade penalty. When the U.S., for example, threatened um, South Korea, um, uh, they said they needed to extend their shelf life for their food on, in their groceries, and South Korea, in fact, did that just because of a threat that they would be taken uh, to one of these um, dispute panel mechanisms under trade laws. And just, um, excuse me, the. CFS and other um, nonprofit and NGOs who've been working with federal agencies um, over the years, we submit numerous petitions uh, that, you know, to the U.S. agencies regarding environmental or food safety violations or regulations that are um, not uh, enacted. And in private, we're frequently told that the agencies just don't respond or feel hampered from responding because they are constrained by trade agreement policies and they just really don't know how to enact certain policies um, under domestic policies that we have in law. Um, and finally, speaking of chilling, um, I just want to uh, have a quote by an attorney representing the Ethel Corporation. This is a case under NAFTA where Ethel Corporation sued Canada via NAFTA for its ban on MMT, it's a gasoline additive known, with known neurotoxins. And after losing the initial case in the, in the NAFTA, uh, the Canadian government settled. Um, it issued an apology to Ethel, it uh, awarded 13 million in compensation and it rescinded its ban. But at the time of the settlement, an attorney, an attorney for Ethel said, quote, 
It wouldn't matter if a substance was liquid plutonium destined for a child's breakfast cereal. If the government bans a product and a company loses profits, the company can claim damages under NAFTA. Uh, quite chilling. <laughs> Other challenges, as we know, have um, impacted food safety and public health standards. We could talk more about that uh, after the uh, uh, meeting here. Um, just then to speak in closing about transparency in the democratic process, um, of course, we've all emphasized it's so important to have these trade texts available for all the reasons that have already been said. And as noted, the meaning and impact of trade agreements depends on their precise language. And those with access are able to comment and have meaningful input. And we know that industry right now is given more access. For example, in the TTIP, there are probably 550 to 600 um, uh, just industry representatives who are having access and input to the TTIP negotiations. And uh, even our elected officials are hampered to see the text. This is certainly not transparent, certainly not democratic. Um, and at times, we even know that industry writes a portions of these trade agreements. Um, for the WTO, for example, we have a quote from a former Monsanto official. He explains how this happens during the negotiation of the WTO's intellectual property rules. And he says, quote, industry has identified a major problem in international trade. They were restricted by their intellectual property uh, rights access. It crafted a solution, reduced it to a concrete pose, proposal, and sold it to our own and other governments. The industry and traders of the world have simultaneously played the role of patients, the diagnosticians, and the physicians. I also find that rather chilling as well. Um, trade agreements affect billions of people, and we believe that publishing the texts are essential if they're going to maintain any uh, credibility that it is a democratic or transparent process. Um, we believe that instead of promoting a race to the bottom in standard setting, trade agreements should set minimum standards for critical <coughs> issues such as food safety and public health standards, and then allow countries to set even higher standards to protect their citizens and the environment. And we advocate for the right of sovereign nations and their elected officials to enact good governance and set high standards and practices that ensure safe and sustainable food for all citizens. And when it comes to food, it's just a crazy system today where we have ships passing in the night with light goods. You know, apples from Washington State are being shipped to New Zealand, and New Zealand apples come to our grocery stores. Sometimes I can't even find an apple from the United States, which is astounding to me. This is not doing the environment any good, much to be said about that, and it's not helping the majority of farmers in our country or in other countries around the world. So as we're all advocating on these panels, it's really time for a shift. We really do need the new 21st century agreement that protect, protects our standards and protects the rights of sovereign nations to set its standards to the highest quality and level um, it deems appropriate. Thank you. Identify yourself. Yes. And, yeah. uh, uh, my name is Matt Shul. I'm a reporter with the Senate U.S. Trade. Uh, my question is for Mr. Hertz. I know that uh, you know you all like uh, you mentioned you've been increasingly involved in the TPP issue since last fall, and uh, you know one of the main points that you mentioned was ISDS, and you were worried about how that could impact drug uh, health, public health programs. And I know that you guys have met with USTR on that issue specifically about investment and recently sent another letter to USTR to follow up on that visit. Have they given you any sort of, uh, you know, reassurances or, uh, you know, considered maybe excluding these type of programs from ISDS? Uh, what, what's been their response to your concerns on that one particular issue? Let me and I apologize, I'm Joyce Rogers with AARP. We did not know the press was going to be here. Okay. I'm going to ask that you follow up with our press shop. Okay. I apologize. That's fine. Yeah, a follow up with our press shop, and I'd be happy to talk with you at a point time. Well, I want to just ask the Attorney General with regard to that uh, question. What happened with the 48 
uh, oh. attorneys general that, that just have asked about this issue. Do you have a response or do we have any? We got a response, but not from the U.S. Trade Representative. We got a response, oddly enough, out of the blue from the National Association of Manufacturers, which is about the tobacco issue. How they happen to become a pen pal of ours, I don't know. But regardless, <laughs> they said, oh, no, you're all wrong. No legitimate public interest regulation is limited by tra tra traditional trade provisions. And they, and they, and this relates to the pharmaceutical issue as well, they absolutely oppose any ex exclusions, uh, you know, product exclusions in the trade treaties. Um, and uh, the public welfare intent of a regulation, whether it's pharmaceuticals, tobacco, whatever, cannot justify a curtailment of certain core rights, whether the right to due process, the right to equal protection under the law, or the right to compensation for government takings of private property. Uh, I think they missed the mark. I don't think they understood what we're talking about. But they actually, for whatever it's worth, that industry seems to be very involved in the negotiations absolutely opposed to excluding pharmaceuticals, tobacco, health regulations, making any specific exemptions. The questions, comments, suggestions, yes. Yeah, hi, thank you. I'm Jim Berger from Washington Trade Daily. Also a bit of the press, I'm referring to the question of uh, inside U.S. trade. Um, if that was a legitimate question, I don't see, and this is a public forum, why can't we get an answer for you if you can say you don't know? Why exclude the press? Again, I apologize. My name is Joyce Rogers. I'm the Senior Vice President of Government Affairs at AARP. I was not informed that press was going to be here. It is, it is our mistake. Follow up with our press shop. You, 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 you're thinking this is off the record, Pamela? No, I, I don't think that that's the case. They may have a policy of who yeah. deals with the press yes. and who does that yes. in their shop, and yes. we have to respect that. And yes. I'm sure that we can come to yeah. uh, you get the answers to your question. Why is AARP on a public well, they are on a public panel and talk about an issue, but various organizations have different uh, uh, policies uh, with regard to the press and who handles the press. I think you have the information. I think you can be in touch and you can get the kinds of you know response uh, that you are looking for and you can probe the issue uh, with, without putting a staff person uh, under uh, the, the scrutiny when the overall organization has specific press policies. I'm not afraid to, uh, you know, I, 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 I will answer the press and so forth, but if they have, if, they, if, if that is a rule of the road, then uh, I will uh, abide by it. And if you have a specific question, uh, and uh, the gentleman there does, I would suggest you talk to Ms. Rogers, okay? <laughs> Other questions? Suggestions, and I guess that was a complaint. So uh, <laughs> suggestions are complaints. Anyone else? Uh, well, you know, first of all, let me just thank you, uh, the, the, the two of you, because I do believe, um, and I don't know what uh, response uh, that you have given or what's been excluded, but I think we have an example of what kind of a response we were given. I can just tell you that uh, uh, the responses that members of Congress have received. I'm sorry, Mr. Tonko isn't here at the moment when he uh, wrote and asked for information, got a very perfunctory answer. Uh, our questions have not been answered in a fulsome way as we've gone through uh, this, uh, th this process. The two areas that uh, you both have covered, um, I think, are critical to the public's understanding of what this issue is all about, and that is with regard to uh, uh, health issues and drugs, uh, prescription drugs, and what the, what the potential is there that ties in uh, with the investor state issues that our Attorney General uh, spoke about, uh, the food safety issue, an area in which I've spent a lot of time and focus on, and I have fought over and over again with regard to moving from equivalent, uh, from equal to, to equivalency. Um, uh, because even when there is, even when there is an audit of one or two of the plants in the foreign country, uh, uh, and whether they pass muster or not, they always pass muster, um, that once you grant equivalency, any, any plant can then uh, export.
to the United States, and we have opened the floodgates. Um, what we try to do here today, I want to thank you all, and thank you all for hanging in and staying uh, up through the end, and I want to thank our panelists all, but we try to set the stage uh, with um, Dr. Sachs, who I think laid out these issues in a very, very cogent way, and then try to focus in on some of the areas that are really the heart and soul of, of where we want to go, at where we want to go, that's the income inequality um, uh, issues, the labor rights, uh, the environment a piece of this, the investor state piece, what we're doing with regard to health and prescription drugs and uh, food safety, and then we also brought up the issue of the uh, currency manipulation and a good back and forth piece on, on that uh, and, and discussion about that. This is very, very critical. I think for the very first time in a long time, members of Congress are deeply engaged in this effort. Um, and uh, we are, uh, want to recapture what our responsibility is in this regard and understand what this means to working people in this country, poor people in this country, the future economic growth of this nation, and all of those issues that are external like food safety and health and so forth. And for us to abdicate that responsibility, in my view, means that we really don't belong here. We don't belong here to take on what the public interest is. Um, and what we should have before we leave we know this, nothing's going to happen now, but when we come back in a lame duck session, we ought to have a real back and forth and a debate on this issue as it comes up and people will present their arguments. As I said earlier, I truly do believe the momentum, the issues, the intellectual pursuit on these issues um, as it pertains to the future of the United States and what our goals and our priorities are and our economic growth are about are tied up here, and let's have an open public debate about what this treaty means to our future, and I believe it is on our side, uh, and we have to go back to the drawing boards and make sure that our interests are protected here, our goals are protected here, as we move toward globalization. Thank you all for being here this morning.